Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Good morning. My name is Duffy Robbins. Good to see you. I uh, actually uh, flew here yesterday from Pennsylvania. I teach youth ministry at Grove City College uh, in Grove City uh, on the Pittsburgh side of the state. And uh, been coming here to Faith Bridge for, for, I think, like 12 years now. I've been part of the teaching team. And it's always, always a delight to be here. And if you're visiting this morning, it's just uh, fantastic. Good to see you. Um, I... I um, I've been seasick twice in my life. Uh, and in 100% of those occasions, uh, I found the experience immensely unpleasant. Um, and, and I think I can say uh, safely that uh, the people who were present when this happened and who witnessed my seasickness would also uh, testify that it looked unpleasant. Uh, uh, But I can say this, but the most unpleasant of those two experiences uh, happened several years ago uh, up in Long Island Sound. I was actually speaking at a middle school uh, weekend, middle school retreat, um, on this island right off the coast of Connecticut called Fisher's Island. You may not even know that there were islands out there, but, uh, but this was a small island and there was a retreat center in the middle of it and it was a great weekend. It was Sunday morning, it was our last session and literally I was, I was doing the Sunday morning session when all of a sudden uh, a, a local uh, kind of security emergency personnel guy uh, ran in through the back door and just basically interrupted everything and said, look, uh, there are gale force winds uh, blowing across Long Island Sound. Uh, it's getting unsafe for the ferry to make the trip back over to uh, New Haven. And, and so uh, the last one is going to leave. If you want to get to the land, you need to leave in 45 minutes, be down at the dock in 30 minutes, because that is the last boat for the day. And if you want to get off of this island, and we recommend you do, you need to be on that boat. Well, you can imagine that kind of uh, ushered in a little bit of a panic. In fact, I cut my message short by about 30 minutes. But, but uh we, we, uh, we actually all hustle down the dock. We get down there. Uh, and, and when we arrive, we get there just in time to see the captain trying to dock the ferry. But, but the problem was, even in the harbor, the waves were so big, the, the water was so violent that he was having a hard time doing that because every time he'd get close enough to come into the dock, um, the waves would pick up the ferry high enough that he was actually afraid it was going to come down and, and crunch the dock. And so it took him 45 minutes just to get the boat moored so we could get on the thing. We finally get on the thing, and, uh, and, and, uh, and at this point, I'm kind of excited, right? Because I'm going, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Like, I've never, I've never seen anything like this, never been part of something like this, like the Weather Channel, National Geographic, you know, Wicked Tuna, uh, Dangerous Catch. This is going to be fantastic. And so, I mean, I distinctly remember I actually took my little infant daughter, <laughs> my older daughter, Erin, she was just a little baby. I perched her on my shoulder uh, because I said, sweetheart, daddy's going to show you a hurricane. And so, and, and so we, we, uh, we went out and, uh, and literally stood on the upper deck of the boat, uh, and, and I thought, this is awesome. This is amazing, the power of nature. And then we cleared the breakwater, and no sooner do we clear the breakwater than all of a sudden these huge waves start breaking over the bow of the boat. I mean, literally, Aaron and I are getting, are getting wet from the spray. And, and so it dawns on me, this might not be safe. And so I go back inside. As soon as we close the door, come back inside the upper deck of the ferry, this massive wave sweeps over the whole thing. I mean, just just crashes over the second deck. And of course, that uh, initiated uh, a, a screaming fest with about 100 middle school students uh, who were on the boat. Uh, and that's when things started to get very, very scary because the boat uh, was being lifted out of the water by the waves. And it was just this, uh, you know, it kept going up and down the boats. And, and little by little, I could just feel something happening in my stomach that was not right. Uh, Aaron was clinging to my neck and I was getting hot and I took off my jacket and then I took off my sweater and then I took off my shirt and then I didn't want to make anybody else seasick so I kept my t-shirt on but, but I, I, 
it's not funny. But, but uh, it finally came to a point, and some of you know what I'm talking about. We just go, this is going to happen whether I like it or not. And so I just bolted for the nearest bathroom and dove for the stall where I met a very indignant woman uh, who, who, who seemed to uh, lack uh, any compassion whatsoever uh, and, and, and didn't even give me her name. And that's when I did uh, pretty much what I had to do as quickly as I could. And, uh, and, it, was, and it was awful. I mean, it was absolutely awful. Awful, and of course, it wasn't just it wasn't just the seasickness, right? It's 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 the double whammy, right? It's 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 the nausea, the humiliation of having my family and 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 all these screaming middle school kids uh, see this, uh, and then of course, what compounded everything was the very real sense that we're out of control. Like, like we, we are at the mercy of the sea. Our course is being determined more by the storm than by the skipper of our boat. If you've ever been on a boat in a storm on a reckless sea, you know precisely what I'm talking about. It is unsettling. And I think that's, I think that's partly why uh, I, I'm, I'm so intrigued by the episode that we're going to be looking at this morning in the book of Acts. Because it plunges us plunges us right into the middle of one of the most violent storms recorded in Scripture. And in a vivid, first-person, detailed account, Luke tells us a story of one of the Bible's only shipwrecks at sea. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite this morning to turn me to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. And if you don't have a Bible, if you'll just raise your hand, you see these good folks coming down the aisle, they'll be happy to give you one. So you can follow along. Just put your hand up in the air and um, they'll make sure you get a Bible. Let me just say, if you don't have a Bible, you're visiting a day or you just don't have one, keep this uh, Bible. Just keep it as a gift um, uh, from your friends here at Faith Bridge. Acts chapter 27, we're going to begin reading in verse uh, 13. And I'll sort of set the stage by uh, telling you that Paul, the Apostle Paul, Um, in this passage uh, is actually in the custody of Roman soldiers, okay? Uh, They're holding him as prisoner because they're taking him by sea to Rome where he is to stand trial before none other than Caesar himself. So this is why they find themselves on this particular day out on the open water. Acts chapter 27, we'll begin reading in verse 13. Now, when the south wind blew gently... Supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Kauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. That would be the lifeboat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship, then fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis. Now, the Sirtis refers to uh, an actually an area uh, in the Adriatic Sea called the Sirtis Sands, and it was essentially uh, these two dangerous, shallow uh, gulfs off the coast of, of North Africa. Fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lured the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they'd been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet, now... I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night, there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. Verse 27, when the 14th night had come, as you're being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. A little farther on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they set down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day 
to come. Okay, let's fast forward now to verse 39, because now uh, it's daylight. They've survived the night. Uh, they see what looks like land, but they're not really sure where they are. They really have no idea. Verse 39. When it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors. They left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then, hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow struck and, and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan at this point was to kill the prisoners, that would be Paul, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion in charge, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Wow. Wow. Wow, you know, you, you start to read through uh, th these, these chronicles of Paul's life and ministry, and you begin to realize that the Christian life, uh, whatever good things it might be, it is not a guarantee of an easy ride. God invites us to this amazing adventure, but it is not, it is not a pleasure cruise. It's not a party boat, it's discipleship. And, 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 and Paul's life is a full color picture of precisely that truth. In fact, you read through uh, Paul's writings and you read accounts of beatings and imprisonments and, and, and close calls and narrow escapes. Uh, in fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verse 25, Paul says he was beaten three times. Uh, he was uh, actually in three different shipwrecks. Note to self, never sail with Paul. Uh, on one occasion, uh, he tells us he was actually adrift at sea. Uh, he goes on to say he was attacked by mobs, he was stoned, and he was arrested at an anti-war rally. Just kidding. Uh, every time I hear Paul saying he was stoned, I just think back. But, uh, but uh, I, that's because I work with high school students. But, but, but when you think about it and you look at all this stuff, you know, it's kind of incredible. It's kind of incredible. Here's what I want us to understand in an odd way. When you start to read through this catalog of bad stuff, in a way, it can actually give us a type of encouragement. Because all of us in this room this morning, Pastor Ken mentioned this, all of us know what it's like to face storms and, and turbulence. Maybe it's a difficult situation at work. Maybe it's the test that came back positive. Maybe it's the, the monthly stress of paychecks that seem to run out before the month does. Or, or maybe it's a rocky marriage or family struggles or, or, or hassles with friend or a car that keeps breaking down, a relationship that feel like they're breaking up. And, 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 and real life brings real storms. Only toy boats get to sail in perpetually calm seas. And if the Christian faith can't help us survive the bad news, well, then it's not good news. It's not good news. Which is why I want us this morning to consider a simple question, a very simple question. How is it that in the teeth of this storm, with the wind howling and the thunder and the, and the jeopardy in which they find themselves... How is it the Apostle Paul can say in verse 25, take heart, take heart, have faith in God? How does he say that? How, how can it be that, 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 that I mean, the ship is basically breaking apart right under him? He's got the crew plotting to kill him, and, and the storm is raging, and Paul says, even so, it is well. It is well with my soul. And what does that mean for us this morning? What does that mean for us when we sail into those stormy places of life? I want us this morning to make three very, very simple observations from this text in Acts chapter 27. And the first observation is this. The first observation, uh, God uses the storms in our lives. God often uses the storms in our lives to accomplish his purposes. God uses the storms in our lives to accomplish his purpose. Now, let me be very clear here. I'm not saying God always causes the storms in our lives. That's, that's, that's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. Frankly, sometimes God just allows us to sail into the storms of our own bad decisions, of our own indecisions. Um, but I am saying that God does sometimes use these storms in our life to accomplish his greater 
purposes. I remember when I was a youth pastor at my last church, uh, we were going to have a, a, a 50s night with the youth group. And, and it's just exactly what it probably sounds like. We were going to have a ca- kind of a whole evening where we had uh, 50s music and the kids were supposed to come kind of dressed in 50s clothing. And we were going to do some games, with kind of a 50 motif. And, and then as a feature of the evening, we were going to actually show an old 50s movie uh, with Annette Funicello and Frankie Avalon uh, called Beach Blanket Bingo. And, uh, and we were, uh, we were going to actually show it backwards. Uh, we thought it'd be a little bit more entertaining, more interesting. Um, and, uh, and, and back then, when you had 16 millimeter projectors, you could actually just run the film backwards and you'd have audio and everything. Now, uh, even the very mention of 16 millimeter uh, projectors probably leaves some of you a little bit befuddled. Uh, some of you have been around a while. You may remember these monstrosities. Uh, they were huge projectors that you would use to show movies. Um, they kind of looked like a, a robotic Mickey Mouse. They had two big, huge reels on either side, and then this labyrinth of sprockets and gears through which you thread the film uh, to the take-up reel. And, uh, and, 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 and these things were otherwise known as instruments of Satan. And, uh, and they were notorious for, uh, for, just, for just breaking down. Well, uh, the evening had gone great so far. The, the kids looked off some wearing 50 stuff. The games had gone great. Now it's time to show the movie. And, and uh, the way we did it was we had, uh, we're, gonna, we're actually at the gym at Asbury Theological Seminary. We're going to show the film up on the wall of the gym, so like a drive-in theater. And we had some people kind of skating through and doing refreshments. And the kids were seated in rows. And, uh, and we're now ready to start the movie. And so, you know, I do the routine. Okay, uh, lights out. Uh, roll it. But there was, uh, there was no film. There was no image there. I mean, there was an image, but it was, it, you, couldn't really, you couldn't really see anything. All you could do was hear the audio, and the audio was backwards. Like, and, and, and I, because of my youth ministry experience, realized it'll be tough to keep the kids entertained with this for an hour. And so, and, and so I said, oh, well, <laughs> turn it off. Well, turn it off. Let me, and I go over and take a look at it. This is pretty routine for these projectors. Check the sprockets. Check the gears. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, lights off. Roll it. Again. Okay. <laughs> Put the lights back on. Let me fix it one more time. Come A couple of other, you know, kids were like the AV kids. They came up and and uh, and then we kind of worked on this some more. And and, and I, okay. All right. Great. Uh, and by now I'm getting a little bit nervous, right? Because I know I've got an hour of program. We'd invited some other churches to join us, so I'm kind of feeling embarrassed. And. Uh, and for the third time, it does not work. And that's when I'm going, okay, Lord, you know, I mean, why don't you just heal it? Like, I mean, that's what you do. Like, just, you know, and, and uh, I mean, don't you realize these kids need to see Beach Blanket Bingo so they can meet Jesus? And, and, uh, and, and, and it, it, it wasn't going to happen. It just didn't get, it wasn't going to get fixed. And, and so I'm already a little bit upset, already a little bit on edge. And somebody, I don't know if it's a kid from our group or a kid from another group, but somebody yelled out, we want our money back. <laughs> All I could think of was, where would you like me to put it? Now, I didn't say that, but uh, anyway, uh, I just, that, that's it. I just lost it. And all of a sudden, to my utter surprise and to the shock and astonishment of everybody, I launched into a rant. I just yelled out, everybody up against the wall. <laughs> Had no idea what they were going to do over there. So everybody up against the wall. And, and, and I just kind of started just yelling at these, like a hundred kids, just, whatever, just kind of, because I love you kids, and beach blanket, bingo, Jesus. And, and, and I'm yelling, and, and, uh, and I finally, uh, and I could see there were a couple of little seventh grade girls in the end, and they were starting to kind of, so I, I saw, okay, there's the weak spot. And I went for that. And, and, uh, and, 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 um, and finally, after about, I don't know, six or seven minutes, I mean, of course, the kids in my youth group, they think, oh, no, 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 it's a role play. He's the demoniac. And, and uh, it's the teaching. It, my benediction at the end of thing, I said, you want your money back? You're going to get your money back. You know why? Because this night is over. Go home, bye. And a couple of my leaders came up because at first nobody could really believe it. And then these two little seventh grade girls, they go over to our little cash box 
and they wait to get their dollar back. And, and, and two of my leaders come up to me like, like Duffy, I just, I just like, I was a total brat. I went, no, uh, no, we're, we're done. We're done. And I just remember that night walking home because we lived there in Wilmore. It's probably, we lived about maybe eight minutes from the church. And I just remember thinking like, what will your next career be? And, uh, and, uh, and it was just a total disaster. Everything about that night just that could go wrong went wrong. That was Saturday. Sunday came and went. I was kind of an automatic pilot in a funk. Uh, then on Monday, on Monday, this is the great thing about living in a small town. On Monday, the postman saw me and said, Duffy, I have a letter for you. <laughs> and he hands me this letter, it's handwritten, and I opened up, it's one of those Christian greeting cards, right? And on the front, it had like storm clouds. And um, I opened it up, and essentially, it's from this girl, I'll call her Allie, it's not her real name. Essentially, she says, Duffy, uh, you know, I'm so sorry that we upset you last night at the, at the 50s deal, and I, I mean, we, you worked so hard to love us and take care of us, and I just, I feel really, really bad, but I do want you to know this, when I got home and I started thinking about how upset you were, it just reminded me of, of how much you really love us, and, and it reminded me of how much God loves me, and I just want you to know, I'm never going to forget this night. And I go, that's right, Allie. And that's why we staged this entire episode. <laughs> yeah, but Now, I don't know if that was a shipwreck, but I can tell you one thing. Everybody there will tell you it was a train wreck. I mean, it was a mess. It was a disaster. Everything about it was bad. And yet, and yet, here's what's amazing. With all that, it ended up setting the stage for an encounter with God. And I wonder this morning if, if there's somebody in this room who needs, to, who needs to hear that because you're facing some major storms in, in your life. And, and, and to use those words from Acts chapter 27, verse 20, it feels like you've ni seen neither sun nor stars nor moon for many days and all hope of being rescued is pretty much just lost. Seems like every day. We hear these new reports that we are a society deluged by, by storm clouds of anxiety and, and depression. Gene Twing, a uh, San Diego State University psychologist uh, and author of the book Generation Me, Why Today's Young Americans Are More Confident, Assertive, Entitled, and More Miserable Than Ever Before. She analyzed responses of over 77,000 college students surveyed from 1938 all the way through 2007, and what she found is that five times as many high school and college students are dealing with anxiety and other mental health issues today as young people in the same group were dealing with back in the period we ironically call the Great Depression. And guess what? This is not just confident, assertive, entitled, miserable teenagers same thing happens with adults. We, 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 we see it, 16.2 million adults in the U.S., almost 7% of American adults have had at least one major depressive episode in a year. T.A. talked to us about this last week, didn't he? When he talked about tough stuff, issues, and he talked about suicide. A lot of us in this room this morning, we know what it feels like to be blown off course. We know what it's like when our plans have pretty much uh, run aground. And, 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 and as Luke puts it in, in verse 20, all hope of being saved is lost. And please understand, this is not about me trying to somehow tell you this morning that those storms aren't real, or that those storms aren't scary, because they're both. They're all that stuff. But what I am saying is this simple fact, that those very real storms, those very real scary moments can be used by God to accomplish his purposes. We saw this last month, didn't we, in our series on Jonah. Some, some of you were there. God used a storm and a very large fish to turn Jonah's life around. And sometimes that's what it takes for some of us. Now, Paul, in his case, he wasn't running from God. He was, he was running for God. But because of that storm, because of this storm, his life his life was spared by his captors. Uh, God gave him a great ministry among the people there on the island where they ended up living for a few months over the course of the winter, the island of Malta. And frankly, it helped Paul 
get to Rome to appeal his case before Caesar. Now, that, that doesn't mean that God's going to give every single one of us every time a get out of storm free card. But it does mean, and this is so important, that with God, it's always too soon to abandon hope. With God, it's always too soon to abandon hope. That's observation number one. God can use even the storms in your life to fulfill his purposes. Observation number two uh, is this. How we respond to those storms will have a lot to do with what we believe about God and his love for us. How we respond to those storms will have a lot to do with what we believe about God and how we feel God's presence or love for us. One of my all-time favorite Dear Abby letters. Do we have any Dear Abby people here? Anybody ever read those Dear Abby I'm the only one. Anyway, uh, this is one of my favorites. Dear Abby, my husband doesn't drink much, but he sure must have been drunk to do what he did last night. He came home with a pair of ladies' lips tattooed on his behind. He claims he paid the artist to give him a rose, which, by the way, strikes me as not a very strong alibi. Uh, he said he paid the artist to give him a rose. Is there any way of getting a tattoo removed? I sure hope so. Because he'll be leaving, get this, he'll be leaving very soon for a two-week church retreat with our young people. And he is really ashamed of that tattoo back there. And then it's signed, no last name. It simply says, Suzanne W. But, but you know what's interesting? It, 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 you know what's interesting? It is nothing, nothing mucks up and distorts the lens of perspective like guilt. Nothing mucks up and distorts a linda perspective like guilt. You can just imagine this poor guy sitting there at church camp on his tattooed derriere wondering, who knows my secret? Like, like when will I be exposed, so to speak? And, and all week long, it affects everything. Everything he hears, everything he does, uh, every activity, every, every cabin time, uh, every Bible study, every word of encouragement and promise, every challenge is going to be impacted, colored by his sense of guilt. Let me just say, uh, I'm not like some big anti-tattoo guy. Like, I don't see what the big problem is. He, you know, he asked her for a rose, and she gave him two lips. But, but, but what, what is interesting here is that, you, is that you see very clearly. Get up against the wall. Uh, okay. What you see here very clearly is this truth. Nothing distorts and warps our perspective like guilt. It impacts our attitudes. It impacts our relationships. It's like Kristen said in the video. We don't feel good enough. We don't feel worthy of God's love. What we discover is one of the key factors that drives our responses to the storms and the stresses of life is what we believe about God and what we think God thinks about us. You know, it's interesting, one of the great teaching tools of Scripture is that occasionally you can take two passages and place them side by side, and you can see by contrast that, that some profound truth uh, is being taught. Sort of like, on, if you've ever seen those things on TV, you know, where they have two products, product A and product B, and, uh, and then they'll have some person, not an actor, a real person, who will actually test uh, you know, these things. And, and they'll go, oh my gosh, I like taste totally like Coke. And the guy go, yes, ma'am, but we're testing motor oil. But, but, but they'll sort of test these products. And, and it's, sort of this, it's sort of this comparative kind of a thing. Well, well if, if you look at Acts chapter 27, in a sense, Luke invites us to make just that kind of comparison. Because if you look at Paul's calm in the midst of the storm that day, Acts chapter 27 it can almost surely be traced directly back to his confidence in the grace of God, to the gracious forgiveness of God. In fact, we know in Acts chapter 24, verse 16, Paul actually says, I do my best to have a clear conscience toward God and all people. But then it's interesting. If you remember anything at all about Jonah's story, you remember that he was thoroughly tormented by a guilty conscience. In fact, according to Jonah chapter 1, verse 10, he told everybody on his ship that, that he was running from God. In fact, uh, two verses later, chapter 1, verse 12 of Jonah, he literally tells everybody on the boat, I know it is because of me 
that this great storm has come upon you. You put those two narratives side by side and you can see it. The main difference between Paul's response to the storm and Jonah's response to the storm was the difference of a clear conscience. A clear conscience. And of course, the irony in all this is that if anybody had no right to have a conscience that was clear, it was Paul, right? I mean, Jonah, right, he was disobedient and he didn't go and, and, and preach the gospel to the Ninevites as God had told him to do, preach the word. But, but look at Paul's life for crying out loud. I mean, you, you go back, and before he became a Christian, he was, he was a hired executioner. He was a, he was a persecutor of the church. We might have expected God just to flush his boat right down the ocean. I mean, uh, of all people, Paul had no right to have a clear conscience. But that's when we come face to face with one of the great truths of our faith. And it's the truth that buoyed Paul's heart when Jonah's heart sank. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 5. There is now, therefore, No condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those in Christ. You see, the scripture makes it clear that we are, all of us, all of us here this morning, we are all sinners who have have sailed off in pursuit of our own adventures. All of us by nature, we want to be the captains of our own soul. We want to be the, the, the skippers of our own ship. And the scripture tells us very plainly, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages or the penalty of sin is death. But, but, And maybe for some of you, this is the first time you've ever heard this this morning. You're just visiting. Here's the great news of the gospel. By God's grace and mercy, through Jesus' death on the cross, his blood pays the penalty of death that we owe for our sin. And so even though all of us are death deservers, by the grace of God, we have in Christ Jesus a life preserver. We have a lifeline of mercy and grace and how we respond to the storms in our lives and the stresses and difficulties we face will have a lot to do with whether or not we cling to that God in his lifeline of love for us, which is why it is so important for me to ask you this morning, if you're holding on to guilt that is sinking you in the storm. Maybe it's a memory you can't outrun. Maybe it's a habit that you used to have, but now it, it has you. Maybe it's some delicious secret that's become a loud, uh, addictive voice in your life. I, I don't know what it is, but I suspect there's some of us here today, plenty of us, who are not able to take heart in the midst of the storm because our hearts are weighed down by guilt and shame. Great news of the gospel is that the sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, the sin not in part but in whole has been nailed to the cross and we bear it no more. It is well. It is well with our soul. You just hear this confidence and this peace in Paul's words. Take heart. I have faith in God. Observation number two, how we respond to the storms in our lives so often depends on what we believe about God and his love for us. And that brings us to the third observation I want to make this morning, and it's simply this. And this is true not just in Paul's story, but you see it also in Jonah's story. Observation number three, although both men, Jonah and Paul, react differently to the storms they faced, one with fear, one with faith, God's response to both men is perfectly the same. He doesn't give up on Paul, but neither does he give up on Jonah. And that's the great promise that draws us here each week to celebrate God's goodness and his steadfast love and his majesty. That's why we worship here at Faith Bridge, the promise that God is faithful. And what that means this morning is that if you're here, and and, and maybe you're not even sure that you buy this kind of Christianity thing, there's a lifeline for you that you can cling to in the storm. You may not believe in God, but he believes in you. He believes in you and he loves you. And even if you are ready today to abandon all hope or or abandon your faith, or, or maybe it just feels like you're ready to abandon ship, what you need to know is God is not gonna abandon you. 
His love is steadfast. The waters were calm that day on November 21st, 1873, as the French ocean liner Vie de Hove was crossing the Atlantic from the U.S. to Europe. With 313 passengers on board, they were into their fourth day of the crossing when there was a loud noise and a collision. It turns out the Vie de Hove collided with a powerful iron-hulled Scottish ship called the Loch Urn. Suddenly, everybody on board is in a panic. There is pandemonium. Everyone is facing grave danger. And within 12 minutes, the entire ship had slipped beneath the dark waters of the Atlantic. 226 passengers went down with the ship. There was a sailor who was rowing a small boat over the spot where the ship went down. He spotted a woman floating uh, on a piece of the wreckage, and she explained that she had brought uh, all four of her children to the deck uh, with the hopes that they might get off the boat with her, but in the panic and turmoil of the big boat going down, she lost all four of her daughters. When the rescue boat uh, finally delivered the survivors nine days later to Cardiff, Wales, so the docks there, this grief-stricken woman wrote back to her husband in Chicago with this very, very simple telegram, saved alone, what shall I do? And the husband, of course, uh, hearing of the tragedy, immediately uh, books passage on the next available ship and leaves to join his wife. And, 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 uh, and it was on the journey across the Atlantic, some of you know this story, about four days out, that the captain summoned this guy down to his cabin and told him that they were right now over the place where his children died at sea. And it was at that point, according to his daughter, Bertha Spafford Vester, who was born after the tragedy, that her father, Horatio Spafford, went back to his cabin and wrote the words to the hymn that we sang this morning. When peace like a river attendeth my way, and when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. My prayer this morning, brothers and sisters, is that God would use this episode in our lives, in our hearts, that God would remind us that he can use the storms in our lives to accomplish his purpose. Even what feels like a shipwreck moves us in the direction of God's calling. Don't ever give up hope. And no matter how violent is the storm, no matter how loud the thunder and bright the lightning, remember that it's God who reigns. And secondly, don't let your guilt be the lens that distorts your view of the world, your life, your, with God. Ask God to forgive you. Throw overboard all that, that dead weight of sin. The scripture tells us if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us. And finally, remember that even if you're here this morning and, and you're, you're ready to uh, abandon hope, God is not ready to abandon you. Whether you're here this morning as a Jonah or whether you are here as a Paul, we can discover in our storms the absolute, astonishing, extravagant goodness of God. Let's bow our heads together. My benediction this morning, my word for you, is the word that Paul shouted that night in the midst of the storm and the howling wind, when everything looked like all hope was lost, God's word to us is take heart, take heart. I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe as Pastor Ken said, maybe you're dealing with financial concerns. Maybe there's stresses at work. Maybe it's a relational thing. Take heart. Maybe, maybe it's some sort of physical problem. Maybe it's something in your family. Maybe it's addiction you cannot seem to get rid of, and it's just causing a storm in your relationships and in your life. Take heart. Have faith in God. Lord, this is our prayer this morning. Would you give us a word of encouragement today? We see these deep, dark places in our lives, oceans of difficulty. Some of us walk in here today, and it's great. It's like the opening verse in the passage, a gentle wind blowing across the bow of our life. But there will be storms. Others of us know those storms right now. I pray, Father, 
that you would encourage us to come to you, to draw near you, maybe to be a part of that Kairos event where we can begin to rethink who you are and what that means for us. But Lord, move us today to trust in you, to be able to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Pray this in Jesus' name. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. My name is Wayne Risher. I'm the Family Life Pastor here at FaithBridge. And today, if you're dialing in for the first time, let me just tell you that two things happen here at Postscript. First of all, your questions get answered. And secondly, it gives our teaching team an opportunity to give us a little something extra after the message today. And joining me today is Duffy Robbins, who just finished a great message on the text from Acts 27. So welcome. Glad to have you. Thanks, Wayne. Good to be here, yeah. my friend. So we have a couple of questions that we want to just process after your message today. Right. Uh, the first one is based on one of the points you mentioned. Um, you talked a little bit about today of finding God's will in the midst of the storm. And I suppose that our response, which was one of your points, has a little to do with awareness. And so if it has something to do with awareness, how do we become more aware of God's will in the midst of the storm and uh, the circumstances going on around us? How do we press in to find out what we're looking for there? Yeah, um, that's a great question because part of what I was talking about is that sometimes God, you know, He just uses the storms that are caused by our own bad decisions. We sort of mm -hmm. sail in the consequences of our own bad choices. Other times, um, you know, God uses a storm that, that you know, it's not necessarily because we did anything wrong, but he uses that storm in a way that, that uh, you know, helps him to accomplish his purposes in us. And, and then um, I think it's true, although it's probably a part about God that, that we, we don't like to talk about it, but there are some times when God does punish us and he brings storms hmm. into our lives. That's and good. clearly you see that um, in, in Scripture. So, so uh, storms come their ways. And, I, and part of the question, well, how do I know and, and how do I respond? Uh, and I think that part of the idea, and C.S. Lewis refers to this, is that part of the idea behind a storm is that if nothing else, it slows us down. I mean, it, 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 it interrupts our, our course. It interrupts our journey enough so that sometimes you have to go, wait, wait a minute, you know, what, what's going on in here? I mean, uh, as a male, of course, I am omnicompetent when I'm driving. <laughs> and any uh, instruction about uh, checking a map or, you know, GPS, I mean, that's uh, useless. And, and uh, but there's one thing that uh, will kind of make me stop and pull over, because otherwise I'm just, I'm headed. Yeah. One thing will stop is I go, you know what, I don't, I don't this is not where I'm supposed to be. You know, I'm, I'm somehow off track here. And, and, and storms sometimes force us to pull over or to, or to, to stop. Or in, in the case of Acts 27, to get literally knocked off of the beach and, uh, you know, knocked on the beach. And in Jonah's case, you know, you wind up, you're in hot pursuit of your own plan and you end up in the belly of a great fish. So, right. so I think that's the first thing is that storms kind of, kind of make us alert. And so part of what I want to do in my own life is try to develop uh, that sense of alertness. Um, Wesley called it uh, a sensitivity to sin. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like uh, one a Puritan writer by the name of John Flavel said, it's like when you get something in your eye and you know, you don't, you, you immediately begin to blink and try to flush it out. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if I caused it or, you know, but it's here. And, and, and it's, a, it's not that I am perfect, but I am trying to be sensitive to God's movement in my life. And I want to try to respond, uh, you know, whether it's a storm, whether it's a grain of sand in my eye or, or whatever. I really, want to, I really want to be attentive to that. So part of it is an attentiveness. Um, different Christians down through the centuries have practiced this attentiveness different ways. Uh, Leighton Ford, for example, uh, an evangelist of the Billy Graham Association uh, wrote a book called The Attentive Life in which he talks about practicing um, what's, uh, what are the uh, calls to prayer throughout the day that uh, monastics would mm. often do. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a way of saying, look, pull over, you know, 
pull over several times a day. If, even if it's just for a minute, literally, mentally pull over in your heart and say, God, what's going on here? What am I excited about? What am I, what am I, what, what feels, is there a, a kind of a, sort of a, something in my spirit that's not right? And so, and so it's, it's the first thing I think is in paying attention. But that's also one of the reasons why it's great to have uh, fellowship, like a small group we have, the, you know, right. here at Faith Bridge, because because sometimes um, I don't see stuff uh, in, in driving. For example, is quite often my wife who will first ask, "Do you think <laughs> this is the right road?" <laughs> I don't want to ask that question because I think it might not be. Yeah. So having people in my life, uh, a, a band of brothers or sisters, somebody's going to walk with us. Um, it's a different kind of attention. It's someone else paying attention. Uh, to my life, um, so I would say those those are are two ways of uh, of doing it. You know, um, I think it was Ignatius who talked about the examen that every night when he goes to when he would go to bed. Uh, you know, this is again part of monastic tradition. He would think back about his day. What was the consolation and what was the desolation mm, of my day? So in good. essence, what was the storm? That's the yep. desolation, and what was the consolation? Where did I sense uh, God's God's, you know, goodness or God's blessing in a good way, um, and so that's that's another way you, that, that you could just do that at night, laying in bed before you drift off to sleep, just do something along those mm -hmm. lines. But essentially, it's it's trying to be attentive, trying to pay attention. Jonah was trying to ignore God; he felt it. <laughs> right. Paul was in the going. You know what? I still see God. I, I'm still seeing God in the middle of the storm. Mm -hmm. That's good. So pulling over. Being in community, and the third one you mentioned. Well, that that, that, the that daily that, debrief. Sort yeah, of sort a, of a daily debrief, yeah. right? Where you just you, you might at night just say, "What am I? What's my consolation and what's my desolation?" That's a good rhythm. So yeah, yeah. that's a good way to help us drive into our awareness in the middle of the storm. A second question I had um, was: Some of us have shipwrecks in the past. Yeah. Specifically, <laughs> we may feel guilty for the way we didn't trust or respond rightly to God. And, yeah. and worse, uh, are those of us who are dealing with our own storms made by our own hand, our own mm -hmm. shipwreck. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you mentioned at the very end of your talk a little bit about um, uh, guilt and not letting that be the lens with which we filter. Can you bring that a little clearer for us and, and expand <laughs> that so we can find out how guilt might keep us from right. finding the will of God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, um, again, um, in the, in the sermon today, I talked about this, I read this Dear Abby letter and that this guy got, you know, tattooed on his <laughs> behind. And, uh, and so, uh, he feels really guilty about having that. He's going to this church camp with all these yeah. kids. And I guess he's a leader or something. And, um, and I sort of made the point that everything he hears that week is going to, is going to be heard through the lens of his guilt. Mm, and what I mean okay. by that is like, is is if I think God is ticked off at me, you know, he's really upset with me for getting this tattoo and, and I don't know what kind of uh, shenanigans led to the tattoo. Maybe that's another podcast. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. he's feeling really terrible. Well, then you're not likely to go to God for consolation when you think your pain and storm is caused by that very God, mm. you know? So, so uh, that's, that's what I mean by don't let the lens muck up and distort mm. your view because guilt will do that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you don't do it by trying to kind of explain your guilt away or by doing kind of a, you know, kind of a uh, Oprahism where you go, oh, well, you know, you're just being true to who you are or whatever, you know? You go, no, you know what? That was a mistake. Yeah. But God is not God is not stunned that I have sinned. That's why I sent His Son Jesus. Um, this is a part of what it means to be a, a person who lives with a sinful nature, and so uh, this is not this is not God. You know, wringing His hand, going, "Now what?" Um, he has made provision for us through His through the blood of His Son. So, so that's what I mean is sort of recognizing that perspective. Mm. Um, C.S. Lewis kind of talked about it as, you know, as sort of remembering too that, that I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but sort of like we think of time as, you know, being this linear thing where this is something that happens a hundred years from now and Jesus' death is something that happened right. 2,000 years ago. Okay. But, you know, C.S. Lewis reminds us that 
God is above all that. He's above time. He's eternal. So God sort of sees the entire table at once. We see the table from here, you know, looking that way. Or maybe we're here looking back and looking at. And so whenever I sin, um, the great news of the gospel is that in that moment, in that eternal moment, God is seeing Jesus Mm. die on my behalf. Mm. God is hearing his son Jesus plead on my behalf. And um, so it's not like when, when you sin, God has to go, oh, yeah, that's right. I remember that thing a long time ago where I died for Wayne. And, you know, it, it's all happening in the, same, in the same moment. That's also why I think our sin is so offensive to God. To okay. his ra- it incurs his wrath because, you know, how, how rude to the 10th power that we would sort of be stomping on the crucifixion mm-hmm. when Jesus is dying here. God sees that. He sees it at the same moment he sees us sinning. Mm-hmm. And it just makes the offense that much, uh, you know, greater, I think. So, so it's, it's the knowledge that, uh, that, that the God that I have offended is the very same God who has extended to me his grace and oh, a way good. to, to uh, deal with the offense. Right. That's a hearkening right back to Genesis because that's exactly what Adam did. Guilt was his filter, and he hid. That's right, he exactly. Hid. And and it, that's still living within all of us. Yeah, we've been uh, hiding from the beginning. Yeah, we've been hiding, and God <laughs> has been pursuing. And and of course, Luke fifteen, the story of the prodigal son, is a perfect, mm-hmm. uh, is a great example of that. A perfect example too of a guy who caused his own storms. R- right. That's you a, know, but you know, even there, the father allowed the son to do that, in a sense, allowed him. I don't think the father said, oh, this is perfect. He's going to take his money. He's going to make some sound investments. He's going to no, <laughs> kid is going to mess it up. Yep. But he wasn't really his son until, I mean, he wasn't all that that meant. He was, you know, in he lived there, but the, the father wanted the son to live in relationship and mm-hmm. to love him and to feel the, the, the benefit of living in the father's house. So I go, okay, all right, you want to know what it's like? Uh, being out of the father, here's the money, go for it, kid. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think that's what that's what happens sometimes when God allows us to face the consequences of our own self-imposed storms. Yeah, that prodigal son story is a great connective example. Yeah, uh, illustration yeah, right. to that. Good. Well, I'll wrap up the last two questions, sort okay. of combined into one. Okay. And th- that is, you quoted Paul at the very end by saying, uh, "Take heart, have faith in God." And yet, I'm wondering how we actually do that—a practical step for that. So, if I'm right here in this moment, how might I write a note to myself and say, "Next time the storm comes, this is how my response ought to be." Mm-hmm. Uh, comment on that for us. Um, I'll say. I'll make just two quick comments. One is, do the next thing. Do the next thing. What I mean by that is that, is that don't let, don't allow uh, fear of the storm or the turmoil of the storm uh, to blow you off course. If you hmm. feel you are on the course of what, you know, like I said, you talk to your friends, you talk, to, you, you, you listen, you're attentive, you say, God, is there something I need to hear? But if you go, no, this, storms happen, mm-hmm. and uh, and they happen to you know they happen to all of us. And and people who are I mean Jesus was killed, so you know these things happen to good people. Right. So so the first thing is I say okay, do not let this storm uh, or do not let this shipwreck in my journey. I'm gonna, I know God is going to carry me through, and it may be my next step. I mean even Paul in this passage Acts 27 it's interesting. He said guys. I know it feels like we're going to die, but you need to eat. You're going to need your strength. Mm -hmm. And then he actually told the captain, some of the guys wanted to get off the boat uh, because they were trying to just escape. And he said, no, you're going to need all these guys. So he, Paul said, no, you know what? In a sense, he was rationally taking the next steps that need to be taken. So I think that's, that's an important part of it. In my own life, when I've, you know, faced trials and stuff, uh, I try to remind myself, okay, don't let that big dog scare you off of the trail. Mm, you know, good. Just keep walking, yep. one step at a time. Yep. And sometimes in a storm, that's that's all you can do. Mm-hmm. Just do the next thing. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth Elliot Leach, you know, talks about this when, you know, her husband Jim Elliot died taking the gospel to the Alka Indians in Ecuador, and uh, and that's one of the comments that she made is that 
in a time like that of just huge grief, he died with four other guys, missionaries, uh, that one of the things she really learned is that you just have to do the next thing. So yeah, if it's a loss thing. of a loved one, yeah, if it's, good. you know, financial, concern, look, do the next thing. But the other thing is do the next thing, but don't uh, do anything drastic. In other words, uh, it would have been very easy for Paul to say, oh my gosh, the boat is going, we're going to jump off out here in the middle of the right. ocean. No, 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 no. It's bad, but stay on the, don't, don't make drastic big decisions mm -hmm. um, that you don't have to make uh, in the middle of a storm because quite often those decisions are not good decisions. Yep. So, you know, do the next thing, but don't do anything drastic that you don't have to do because we're not in a, in a good place to make those choices. That's very helpful. Good word today. Thanks, man. You're always one of Faith Bridge favorite rotation in our teaching team. So glad to have you. My pleasure. Thanks. And glad to have you at Postscript. Hope you'll join us next week as Duffy returns again. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.